Good afternoon, church. It's great to be connecting with you again this midweek. And we've been with Moses quite a while. This is part five of the last, uh, the, the life of Moses. And today we're looking at Moses' last words. Uh, so we're getting to the end of his life. But uh, just to kind of remember where we were, uh, he brought the children out of, of Israel out of Egypt. And during that time, he was working with them to teach them the law and show them and, and, and bring them before God and have them get to know him. And, uh, and these were, a, like they are described, a stiff-necked people. And their first reaction on anything was complaining, 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 complaining. And they were not patient. And we see that, that whole process as the God deals with them. And finally, they get to the promised land. And in that point, when they see that things are too difficult, there's giants in the land, they resist and rebel, which is their uh, other uh, quick uh, focus they always have. And as they resist and rebel, the Lord says, fine. This generation will not see this land, except for Caleb and Joshua, who trusted me. And you will wander in the desert, for 40 years. And then uh, when this generation dies off, I will bring the next generation, the next generation that you said we're going we're gonna to die. No, I'm going to bring them into the land and they will see the promised land. And where we left it off and, and uh, missed some numbers, basically they go back and they wander for 40 years and, and um, people begin to you know, die off. There's some events that happened during that time. But it's a lot of the same. Um, we see in number 16, there's a rebellion against Moses and Aaron as they're trying to, right after this, trying to rebel. The Levites rise up and say, what, what right do you have to go before God? And we have Korah and um, uh, we have uh, people from the congregation, you know, uh, leaders of the congregation says representatives, men of renown, and they gather against Moses. And Korah and his company of Levites gather and say, well, we, we can go before the Lord. We can replace you before the Lord. And the Lord basically, well, he burns up Korah and uh, these men. And then he opens up uh, the, the, the ground and um, basically swallows, swallows those who are, uh, the ground swallows alive. Uh, these, these men, uh, Korah, Dathan, Abiram, some of the leaders that were trying to go against Moses. And the earth swallowed them up, swallowed them up, basically. And just showing his power. Now, the people are, are, are at that point. They're, they're, they're not getting it. They, they just keep, well, Moses, you're just trying to kill us all. We're going to kill us little by little. But it's, they don't see, they keep pointing the finger at Moses and at God instead of pointing their fingers at themselves. And I think that's very interesting. As the people go through all this, they keep giving the blame to God. They keep shifting the blame to God because it's never them. And isn't that what you and I do? If we think of the, the idea of pointing a finger, ever since the Garden of Eden uh, with Adam and Eve, um, when Eve sinned, and chose to take of the forbidden fruit and eat. And then she gave to Adam and he chose knowingly to take and eat. Uh, they fell and they were, they were separated from God. There was that, in a sense, death to, to, to the death, the spiritual death that entered in them. And as that happened, when God comes and says, what happened? The, immediately Adam, Adam says, well, it's the woman that you gave me. So it's either the woman's fault or it's your fault, but uh, it's not my fault. Uh, you, you figure out who's to blame. And then the woman goes, uh, the snake, it was the snake. So was, ever since the Garden of Eden, uh, sinful men, and, and I count myself among them, uh, what they do, how they focus is they point fingers. And we say, oh, no, it's society that's causing all this. No, it's my environment. No, it's my parents. No, it's my, this happened in my childhood, or is this thing, or that thing. Or, it, but it's, it's never pointed back at us. We never uh, take the blame for what is happening. And this was happening in the children. So it was very natural. Uh, they, they're pointing the fingers at Moses. Moses, you're killing us all. And it's like, no. 
your rebellion against God is killing you all. You're, you're going and complaining against God is killing you all. Your, your, your choices are killing you all. But it's not Moses. Moses is the one that's actually trying to intercede for you and save you. And, and Lord, just don't burn them up, you know, and, and, and be there for the people. But they don't, they don't get it. They don't get it. And many times we don't either. We, we're, we're so comfortable pointing the finger at others that we don't point it to ourselves. And that's something that we need to watch out for. So as Moses continues, there's a, there's a, there's a couple more events that Aaron is, is confirming. God confirms uh, Aaron as the, the high priest, not uh, Korah and his other, other Levites. No, Aaron is the one. They all get the, their uh, rods and then Aaron's rod buds and has this piece of wood um, has life in it and has flowers. And so they keep that as a symbol that Aaron is uh, the one that's been chosen by God to lead, in a sense, uh, the Levites and the, the, the spiritual side uh, uh, interceding between the people and uh, God. And so we've seen Moses being confirmed as the one who's leading when we had that prior rebellion uh, with uh, Aaron and his, his sister. Now we see Aaron being confirmed as uh, the one that's a spirit, uh, the spiritual high priest. He's confirmed, confirmed again. Um, but we see that they're also, this is coming to the end of Aaron's life, and we'll see later on uh, Moses is also coming to the end of his. But um, something happens with Moses, and this is uh, something interesting, and I, I find it very interesting, is Moses isn't perfect. Moses, after all this time of, you know, wandering in the desert and listening to the people complaining day in and day out, has had enough come to reach the end of his rope <laughs> and we see him in numbers chapter 20 uh it's just one more day in the life of the children of israel they get up and there's no water so what do they do they complain they complain like they always did so the children of israel uh, came into the wilderness of sin and it's interesting the wilderness of zin sin uh first month and stay in kadesh there was no water Verse two, so they gathered together against Moses, against Moses and Aaron, and the people contended with Moses and spoke, if we had only died with our brethren before the Lord. Now they had a new one. If we'd only died with those who already died already. No, we should have died with them. Uh, why have you brought the assembly of the Lord to this wilderness? Why have you brought us here that we and our animals should die here? The reason then they're in the wilderness, not Moses' fault. They could have been in the promised line, uh, you know, eating, you know, uh, milk and honey and, and having those big, huge grapes. But no, they chose not to trust God. So it's their own sin that has them here. Why have you made us come out of Egypt and to bring us to this evil place? Is it not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranate? Nor there is, and there's any water to drink. There's no water here. Why have you brought us here? So Moses, <laughs> oh, here they go again. Well, what does Moses always do? He goes to the Lord. Uh, and he goes to the tabernacle meeting with Aaron. They fall on their faces and they, and the glory of the Lord appears. Okay, Lord, what do you want us to do today with these people? And, and the Lord speaks to Moses and says, take the rod I've given you and your brother Aaron gather the congregation together and speak to the rock. And listen, he already had a time when he hit the rock. No, he, now he's supposed to speak to the rock before their eyes and it will yield its water. Thus shall you bring water for, the, for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. Okay, Moses receives the instruction. But what happens? He goes, took the rod before the Lord, as he commanded, and Moses gathered together before the rock, and he said to them, okay, Moses today got up on the wrong side of the bed. He was, he was mad. He was just over it. This is too much. I'm, an, I'm sick of this complaining because we see this now. Instead of speaking to the rock, he starts to yell. Here now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Must Notice, we. We bring water for you out of this rock. And Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And water did come out. God did give him water. And the congregation, the animals drank. And we think, okay, that's done. It wasn't quite the way the Lord asked him to do it, but they got water. It wasn't done. The Lord spoke to Moses. 
This was now between Moses and God and Aaron. It says, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given you. It says, because you did not believe me. And notice that. You didn't believe me in, in a sense. He, he believed, I mean, he's seen God bring water out of the rock. But uh, in, a, in a sense, what Moses did was misrepresent God before the people. He gave them the wrong picture of God. He gave them the, the, the false information, and that's where he made his mistake. It was very important that Moses represent God correctly, that Moses lift up God's name and express God's heart to the people. And here Moses is expressing an angry God, a, a, a God that is looking at this rebellious people. And they were rebellious. But at the same time, uh, this is not what God wanted to convey. You know, speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. And I will give them water. And, and for this, Moses doesn't get to go into the promised land. Moses is, in a sense, banned from the promised land. And we see that, um, that affecting, in a sense, his entry into the land, which uh, is, is a, in a sense, a sad thing for Moses. But we also see here the importance God places on the way that we represent, especially those in leadership, represent him. Um, one of the, the you we see in the, in the scripture, not many of you become teachers because you will receive a, a greater condemnation in a sense that a greater accountability as you become teachers because you are you are representing God to the people. So, and then there's the other one of you know whoever causes uh, one of my children to to fall, it'd be better for them to have a millstone put around their neck and then to be put into the deepest sea. Uh, this this is something that that God takes seriously. And we see that from Moses. Moses here is, is um, in a sense, told you're not going to enter the promised land. We'll see a little bit more about this later, but keep that in mind as we continue to see uh, what goes on with Moses. So the people finally, you know, it just time passes. We don't see much, you know, of what these 40 years look like. This is, we kind of pick it up at the end of this. Uh, they're still, you know, complaining. Even the next generation uh, has that had, uh, habit they learn from their parents. Um, they, they, there's still the, a couple episodes. There's one where God sends snakes into, the, into them and they start, they start biting people. That's where the famous you know, bronze snake on a rod is, is, is lifted up. And, and now it's a symbol for, uh, in a sense, medicine and the medical field, the snake on the rod. And, uh, and they, as, as they look at that, this, uh, they, they were healed. And it's an allusion in a sense to Jesus being lifted up on the cross. So uh, we, we, we have some more episodes of them, but they finally start getting and heading their, you know, towards the way. And instead of going the way they went before, they're gonna go through these nations that are kind of on the way. They go to Moab. And uh, as they're in Moab, um, they 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 becomes to have they begin to have more and more battles. Uh, they begin to have more and more uh, issues. So they go towards Moab, and then they get to King uh, Sihon, uh, the king of the Amorites. Uh, can we go by? And they said we just want to go through. Of course, none of them wanted to let them through. So they they fight them and they fight they fight this king and defeat him. And uh, then we the next one we see is King Og, <laughs> King Og. And uh, they also doesn't let him pass, and, and they, they fight him and defeat him. And then they, they get to the plains of Moab, and the Moabites are a little worried. That's two kings, or I mean, that's two kings, and then they've already had all these battles and are defeating this mass of peoples coming towards them. What are we going to do? And this is where the king Balak sends for Balaam, the, the prophet, to come and curse the people. And we have the, the great story of the donkey uh, speaking uh, to Balaam on the way there. But we're going to continue and focus on Moses. We see that uh, they're not able to be um, uh, 
cursed. God doesn't allow him to curse him. Instead, he blesses them and he blesses them and he blesses them. But Balaam does one thing. He uh, gives Balak the advice, you know, you want uh, to defeat them, you need to make them defeat themselves. Uh, and, and, but what does he do? He says, you know, send your young women in, you know, send them in, uh, let them do their thing. And, uh, as they fall and give themselves to, um, to your idols, the Lord himself, uh, will judge them. And that's what happens in numbers 25. Uh, the, the women go out, uh, and they begin to commit, it says verse one, harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited them to sacrifice to their gods, and Israel joined itself to the Baals, to the Baal worship, and the Lord's anger was uh, aroused against Israel. They, they, they defeated themselves, and so uh, Balak didn't have to send his forces. God did it uh, for him, but um, we see uh, Moses saying, you know, we need to stop this because the Lord is going to judge. So there we have Phinehas, son of Eleazar, uh, son of Aaron the priest, rose around the congregation and begins to um, kill the people that are that are giving themselves to uh, the Baals and the Baal worship. And God honors him. And, and God stops a plague from coming into the people and for just uh, trying to uh, destroy them. And then... The Israelites go against Moab and, and defeat Moab. And in that is interesting, in that defeat, we see Balaam is also killed and receives, in a sense, uh, a due reward for his part in all of this. So here we get to the book of number to the end of the book of Numbers. And what they do at the end of the book of Numbers is they number the people again. Remember, we numbered everybody at the beginning of the book of Numbers when they set out towards the promised land and then they didn't go in and then they wandered around and then they number them again. Now, as they're going to go into the promised land for, for good, they number them again. And um, that ends the book of numbers. And here we get to the book of Deuteronomy, which we're going to be focusing in today, because basically the book of Deuteronomy is a retelling of everything we've seen so far. It is Moses' last will and testament. Moses speaking to the people and sharing with them, this is what happened. This is your history, and this is what you need to know, and this is the laws you need to follow. And it's kind of his last plea to the people before he dies to follow God and to uh, serve him. So we have Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy gives us a little recap of all the things that have been happening. And... Um, now, as, they, as they're going in, he says, you know, I'm going to give you this land. I'm, I've set this land before you, verse 8. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to give them and their descendants after them. So he begins to tell a story. This is what you've gone through. Remember, remember. And it's important. I think important for all of us to remember where we've been and remember how the journey and remember our our errors and remember the ways we fall and remember how the Lord was faithful. Remember how the Lord led us and how the Lord continues to lead us. Because by looking back, we can see how the Lord is going to continue and lead in the future. Then we see, and we pick up again, uh, Moses not being able to enter the land in, in Deuteronomy chapter three, verse 23 uh, Moses says, I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness, your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, please let me cross and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains in Lebanon. The Lord was angry with me on your account, he says, and would not listen to me. So the Lord said, enough of that. Speak no more of me of this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah. Lift your eyes towards the west and the north and the south and the east. Behold, it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over the Jordan. But command Joshua and encouragement and strengthen him, for he shall go over before his people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you will see. So they stayed, and Moses stopped asking. This is what the Lord says, you're not going to go. But Moses, once he does do, he, he starts to, to share with them, you need to obey the Lord. You need to obey the Lord. And in Deuteronomy chapter 4, it says, Now listen, O Israel, listen to the statutes and judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live, go in, possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor shall you take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. 
Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all men who followed Baal at Peor. But for you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Hold fast to the law. You know, he says, I've taught you the judgments. I've taught you the statutes that God has commanded me. And you should act accordingly. So therefore, observe them. This is your wisdom and your understanding the sight of the people who will hear this statute. Surely this great nation is wise and an understanding people. Study the law and get to know the law. Follow it. Don't, uh, don't break it. God is giving you the way to follow. He's giving you the path. Um, continue in, in it. And, uh, you know, teach them. And we see in, in verse 9, teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Pass them on. And as this is going on, fire is coming from the mountains, and he reminds them about the Ten Commandments and beware, has them beware of idolatry and beware of, of all the things that they're going to see because they're going to have influences around them. They're going to have the, the, the people that were there. Don't take up the idols of the people that were in the land. Don't follow them, but follow God. Remember, remember the law. And he begins, remember your rebellion. Remember what happened when you rebelled against God. Uh, remember uh, this. And, and he gives them a, a very interesting uh, uh, thing to, to, to ponder. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9, uh, verse 4, it says, When you get into the land, when you get into the land, do not think in your heart after the Lord, your God cast them out before you, saying, Because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me to possess the land. But it's because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. It has nothing to do with you. The wickedness of this nation is causing the Lord to drive them out. So it's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you possess the land, because the wickedness of these nations that the Lord drives them out before you, that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, don't get a big head when you get into the land. Notice what it says in Deuteronomy 11. And, and this is kind of the heart of, of Moses as he's speaking these last words to the people. Um, verse 8, therefore you shall keep every commandment which I commanded you today, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give your fathers to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land which you go in to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come. Remember, they always say, oh, the land of Egypt. Oh, the no, no, this is not where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rain of heaven, and land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord of your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. It's a wonderful land. And it shall be, if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command to you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart, and with all your soul, then I will give you rain for your land in the season the early rain and the latter rain that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and new, your oil. And I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourself, lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord anger be aroused against you and he shut up the heavens so that no rain and the land yield no produce and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord has given you. Therefore, you shall lay up these, remember these words of mine in your heart and your soul and bind them as a sign on your hands and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them like the days of the heaven above the earth. This is something not only, and this is where uh, we'll see later on that they sometimes failed. And actually, they, they, that, that the knowledge of, of the Lord and the, and the, the teachings of the Lord were not passed from one generation to the other. So after Joshua, when we get to the judges, it says there rose up a next generation that did not know the Lord. And it's like they, they, they did not pass on the knowledge that all the things that they saw God um, doing in their lives, it didn't pass them on to their children. And, and like the city of teaching their children, speak them as you sit in your house, as you're walking, basically from the time you get up to the time you go to bed, speak these truths to your children so that they know to follow God's commandments. Um, 
It says, for if you carefully keep all these commandments which I command you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to hold fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you and will dispossess greater and mighty, mightier nations than yourself. These giants, we're going to get them out of there. Every place which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours, from the wilderness of Lebanon, from the river to the river Euphrates, to, even to the western sea shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put dread of you and the fear upon you all the land where you tread. And just as he has said to you, behold, I set before you. And this is, the, this is the choice. You have a choice. You need to decide. Blessing and curse. The blessing, if you obey the command of the Lord, which I command you today. And the curse, if you do not obey them uh, and turn aside from which, you know, the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. You have blessing and cursing before you, two paths, two roads. Now it shall be when the Lord has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put a blessing on the Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. And there are they not on, on the other side of the Jordan towards the setting sun in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal, beside the Terebinth tree of, Mor of Mora? So basically what the Lord asked them, he said, you know, this is what you're going to do. I'm going to give you, give you and, and he actually gives that in the next part of Deuteronomy, a list of all the blessings and cursings. This is what, what I, what, what's going to happen. So you're, when you get to the promised land, you're going to go to uh, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal and, and basically these two mountains and, and you're going to put like half the, uh, the Israelites on one and half the Israelites on the other. And one of them is going to recite the blessings of following and obeying the Lord. And the other one's going to recite the cursings and of, of, disobeying and uh, rebelling against the Lord. And it's interesting to the day when you go to those valleys, you, look, you can stand in the middle and see both, both the, the, the mountains. And one of them is green and, and has, is fruitful and uh, is beautiful. And you turn the other one, it's this rock. It's, it's basically just a, a dead rock with, with nothing growing on it. And you see what a visual picture uh, uh, for, for them and for us to see what it means to follow God and obey him and what it means to disobey and to rebel against God. So he gives them the blessings and the cursings and the things that they need to know and reviews the covenant with them. We're now in Deuteronomy 29 reviews. This is the covenant. This is the promise you made God. Remember, this is the, you, we had the sacrifice and you, and you, you, you promised to, to do these things. And just with a sacrifice there, is, uh, if you did not do them, it says, may the Lord do to me like he, we did to the sacrifice. So it, this is a blood covenant. This is something that was um, paid for in, in blood. And we see just like Jesus, when he came to give his life for us, he gave his blood for us so that we might be cleansed. He paid the price for our sins uh, and, and, and set us aside and set us apart to be God's, to God, to be God's people. In Deuteronomy 30, um, he says in verse 19, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I set before you once again, he says, life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. I, I, this, I've given you my last words. I've reviewed everything you've done. Have you seen your errors? Have you seen how God has brought you out? Now I put before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Please choose life that you may live. And it says that you may love the Lord your God and that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to give him. I've given you this promise. So now you are to love your Lord your God. You are to obey his voice. Cling to him. Don't let go. For he is your life. And I love that. Cling to the Lord, for he is your life, that you may dwell with him forever. Then he anoints Joshua as the new leader. Uh, and, you know, Moses in, in, uh, here in uh, Numbers, well, in Deuteronomy um, 31, he goes uh, and says these words to Israel. He said to them, I am 120 years today, 120 years. Uh, he's uh, gone through the, the 40 years of, of uh, growing up in Egypt uh, he's gone through uh, the time in the desert when he had to run away from Egypt. And now he's had the 40 years coming through with the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. He said, I'm 120 year olds today. I can no longer go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over the Jordan. OK, 
okay, it's time to pass the baton, to pass it on to, to the next generation. Um, to the Lord your God himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you. You shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you. Joshua is a new leader, just as the Lord has said. And the Lord will do just as he did to Sihon and to Og and to the Amorites. He will destroy the people before you. The Lord will give them to you that you may do to them according to the commandment which I had commanded you. Be strong, be of good, of good courage. Do not fear or be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. So he called Joshua. He tells Joshua, be strong, of good courage. For you must go with his people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers and to give to them. And you shall cause them to inherit. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Uh, do not fear nor be dismayed. And we'll pick that up as we start looking into Joshua uh, next week. But don't fear. Don't be dismayed. That he is going before you. And then Moses sings a song. And the Lord says, sing this song to the people. So Moses writes a song here in the land of Deuteronomy. We have the song of Moses. He says, Moses wrote the song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. We didn't know Moses was a musician. Well, uh, the Lord gave him a song, and it's not a, it's not a, um, uh, it's, it's kind of a song of warning, <laughs> a song of warning. This is what's going to happen if you don't follow God, kind of remember this song. Uh, he inaugurated Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, be strong and good courage, for I shall bring the children of Israel into the land which I swore to them, and I will be with you. Joshua, here you go. It's your turn now. It's your turn. I've given you the instructions. You know what to do. You've seen what's happened so far. Go ahead. Be strong and get courage. And then Moses dies. How does he die? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 32, if we look at verse 48. It said, The Lord spoke to Moses the very same day, saying, Go up into the mountain of Abraham, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, across from Jericho. View the land of Canaan, which he told him, which I will give the children of Israel as a possession. And die in the mountain which you ascend, and be gathered to your people, just as Aaron died in Mount Hor, and was gathered to his people. Because you trespassed against me, notice he said, you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah. You misrepresented to me um, in the wilderness of sin. Why? Because you did not hallow me, you did not lift me up in the midst of the children of Israel. And that's something we need to remember. Uh, as teachers, as preachers, um, our example, representing God is what we were called to do. And Moses, uh, because of that, doesn't get to enter the land. He said, you shall see the land before you, though you shall not go in, into the land which I am given to you. So we see in chapter 34, Moses goes up to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. This is just crossing over into Jericho is our first stop as they cross over and begin the, the conquest of the land. And the Lord showed him the land of Gilead as far as Dan and Naphtali, the land of Ephraim, Manasseh, and, and the uh, valley of Jericho, uh, the city of Palms, which is Zoar. And the Lord said to him, this is the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. And it says, so Moses died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And the Lord says, the Lord buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, and no one knows this grave to this day. We don't know, and we don't have a tomb site for Moses. He was 120 years old when he dies. He says, his eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. He had the same strength. The Lord had given him strength his whole life. And when the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days, so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. And Joshua, full of spirit and wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And here's kind of the epitaph for Moses. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before his servants, in all his land, and by his mighty power and the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of Israel. Since then, there has not been a prophet like Moses. And um, we see that uh, Moses ends his life full of vigor. Um, he, he ends his life in the Lord's hands. The Lord uh, uh, takes his life, and we see that he is buried. 
and he buries them in Mount Nebo. But we see that these people, there was none other like Moses. He was, uh, in a sense, unique, a man who, who seen, uh, not quite face to face, but who had been in the presence of the Lord and who'd dwelt in the presence of the Lord and who'd been called to do and lead a stiff-necked, stubborn people. An interesting thing in, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses says this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, if from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear, according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire, anymore lest I die. And, and then he says in verse 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all, and I all that I have commanded him. And it shall be that whatever whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. And we've seen the words of Moses, and we've seen what, what we're going to see, what happens to the children of Israel. But uh, it's interesting that uh, this prophet like Moses is uh, alluding to and focusing on the coming of Jesus. And like uh, Moses, he brought the words of God. He was God. He was the son of God coming to speak, to share, to, sh to show us the way. And just like Moses, he gives us blessing and cursing, he gives us a choice to follow. He gives us uh, life. And uh, I'm putting before life and death. And like we see here, uh, we have a choice whether or not we're going to follow, whether or not we're going to choose life, eternal life in Jesus. So as we come to the, the end of Moses and his life, let us learn from the example of the children of Israel. Let us look at our life. Let us reflect on where we've been and what's happened and how the Lord has worked. And let us look the path the Lord has set before us. Let us uh, choose life. Let us choose blessings. Let us choose obedience. And let us follow the Lord step by step. Because he has raised a prophet like Moses, Jesus, who's given us words of life. And he's given his life for us that we might live, that we might have uh, this path, this way to follow him in the way of the master, in the way of Jesus. And may we obey him. May we be near to him. May we cling to him like Moses said. May we cling to him because he is our life. And at the same time, just remember, I think, a warning to pastors, to teachers, to even to parents, you know, be, be aware. God is calling us to represent him, to show him to others. So let us not misrepresent God. That is, in his eyes, something that is um, very, very important. And we see that what happened with Moses. He misrepresented God before the people. He did not lift and hallow his name. Instead, he made him an angry God, and, and God uh, called into account. So let us do the same. Let us represent God correctly. Let us show God correctly. Let us um, show the people, show those around us who God is. He's not a God of anger. He's not a God of, of bad words and, and always judging others and give him, hitting people over the head with a Bible. He's a God of love who wants to give people the choice of life and death, um, blessing and cursing. He wants to give the choice of people coming to him because he's paid the price for their sins. So let us represent God correctly. Not only if we're teachers or pastors, but as Christians, we represent God every day before the world. We represent God every day before others. So what image of Christians do people get when they see us? And I think in the world today, when the world has become so polar, polarized and uh, just uh, very political and all these things going on, it's a sad thing when, um, when Christians, uh, you look at them and you're like, I don't know if I want to identify myself with those people because they're their words and their actions and their deeds are just, just as hateful and, and, and harsh as those from the world. I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus reflected in the church. I want to see Jesus reflected in my life. I want to reflect Jesus to others. And that's my prayer for you today. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. And we'll see you again next week as we look at Joshua. And also remember Sunday uh, this weekend as we continue in our study of the book of Matthew. Amen.